Okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna consider the idea of a utility function representing preferences. Uh, we, we've given conditions such that preferences can be represented by a utility function. It, it was thing in a finite space, it was just simply the, the, the simple axioms of transitivity and uh, completeness and reflexivity. In the infinite space, you, you need this thing called continuity, which I'll give some clue to in the context of lexicographic preferences. What does it mean for a utility function to represent preferences? And just to be clear, I'm talking about preferences over certainties, preferences over this certain outcome, which embodies combination of characteristics, this certain outcome, not preferences over lotteries or uncertainties. So what does it mean for a, pre for a utility function to represent preferences? So a utility function represents which set of things you would prefer to other sets of things. Is that right? That I think I think that's right, but it's a little that's a little bit it sounded like you're a little bit giving me a bit of a circular definition there. Yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, but that is the idea. So the utility function represents preferences if um, whenever the this is sort of casual, maybe I could be more formal, but whenever the utility function yields a higher number for a, well, I could write it simply. So just say, if we, we have this function that can be applied to all of the elements that could possibly be in your choice set, uh, and it represents preferences if whenever utility of A is greater than utility of B, I think I could write this in terms of greater than or equal to, actually, which would be more, but the, the, it, it leads to the same thing. Whenever the utility of A is greater than or equal to the utility of B, it must be the case and this is in both directions, that A is weak, we prefer to B. That's it. Um, so you can, you can imagine if I just, you, know, you can imagine, we, we've talked about different utility functions. If there's only one good, it's very easy. You just, and suppose the person wants more of that good, the monotonicity that we talked about. Then you can just say, okay, the utility function just has to be increasing in that one good. Once I have two goods, you have to start thinking about what is the tr what might be the trade-off between more of one good and more of another good. Um, and there were some preferences that cannot be represented by utility functions, such as the lexicographic preference in infinite space. Basically, be well, it, we'll, we'll maybe we'll cover that in a different video. It's, it's mentioned elsewhere in the text. I'm not sure whether the uh, the one we just mentioned, the, the um, unanimity function, could be represented by a simple utility function. Uh, I have to think about that. Okay. Anyways, uh, what we're all what we're saying here is that an increasing function of a utility function represents the same preferences as that utility function. So, for instance, uh, suppose the function of u of f, some function of u of x y, x comma y it could be x plus y could be square root of x times y plus a thousand. If utility of x, y represents someone's, a given preference relation, so if u of i represents this pre certain preference relation, then any increasing function, any monotonic function also represents these preferences. Okay, uh, so for instance, for a, sorry, that's, that's the other example. That for instance, three times, whatever function this was, like it could be x, y plus 100. Well, it's also the case that three times that function, three times this original utility of x, y, plus or minus seven, also represents those preferences. Okay, so I could define a new function three. So that I could say utility of what utility of x y. Sorry, this chalk's coming out weird at the moment. Equals x plus y squared. Right. Then I could say, all right, well we have this other utility function. we have 
this other utility function, uh, u tilde of x, y equals, uh, let me make the first one x plus y just to make this easier to see, okay? Let's call this utility function uh, x plus y quantity squared plus 10. And of course, we could distribute this. You, you might see, we would see it written as, you know, uh, whatever, x squared. I mean, I, you know how to expand these things, right? Okay. So you might be looking a different way. You might say, is this going to represent the same preferences as this? In other words, if this is greater, if this function is greater, then it's, it's sorry, if for some, uh, for some, so these now you could maybe think of this as x1, x2 from before. So these are two different, two different goods, let's say, right? x and y. So if the function x plus y uh, for some x is greater than, for some x and y, for some bundle x, y is greater than, Right, let me, let me, you know, I think I need to make the notation co more consistent with the previous one. Let me change it to be x1, x2, just because it's, it's going to be a little confusing if we, if we switch between x1, x2, and x, y. I, I might, I might try to erase some of that. Okay. So, so suppose we, we, we say that, um, so, the, so you, we have some function u of x1 comma x2, okay, which would apply to bundles x, you know, and bundles of any two of these two elements, okay? So one, one possibility was u of x1 comma x2 is equal to x1 plus x2. Sorry, did I say x1 plus x2? I think I did, right? Another possibility would be u tilde is equal to x1 plus x2 squared plus 100. Right? Okay, so we also have a preference relation over these, over, we have some preference relation over these bundles of two elements. To say that this represents preferences, that re these represent someone's preferences, it must be the case that for bundle x, which has these two elements, x1 and x2, that whenever bundle x is preferred to bundle y, it must, it, for this particular function to represent those preferences, it must be the case that x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to what? This is the utility for this utility function to represent their preferences. Y one, y two, y one plus y two. Okay, so if this holds for any, you know, for any x and any y, if this holds for all x and all y, then this utility function represents those preferences because the utility is always greater when one thing is preferred to another. Okay, but if this utility function represents their preferences, does, does this utility function represent their preferences? Does u tilde also represent their preferences? Uh, I mean, it's always gonna be preferred to y, even if it's that, even if it's u tilde as well. If you put y1 and y2 in there, then you're, you're still going to get x1 and x2 is higher. Well, uh, so in, in other words, if x1 plus, so if x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to y1 plus y2, it's also the case, it will always also be the case that x1 plus x2 squared, presuming these things are positive, I should, well, even, even not. Uh, x2 squared plus 100 is greater than or equal to y1 plus y2 squared plus 100. Uh, you know, you, you know just mathematically that this implies this. I'm allowed to square both sides as long as these are positives. 
Uh, even if they're negative, I'm not disturbed by said. No, no, then the, then the inequality would reverse. But as long as these are positive, but I should have said, let's assume these are positive. I can square both sides. I can add 100 to both sides. The inequality is preserved. OK? And any inequality preserving transformation is called an increasing transformation or monotonic. I think a monotonic mean, or just let's say an increasing transformation. OK? So any, any function f of x such that if x1 greater than x2, then uh, f of x1 is greater than f of x2, that's an increasing transformation. OK? Uh, so I think it's tri I mean, we, I didn't give a very formal proof, but I think it's trivial to see that if, if basically, if someone makes their decision, if not shouldn't say decision, we're talking about preferences. If someone's preferences agree with a utility function or rationalize about a utility function, whenever one thing is preferred to another, uh, it will always yield a greater utility according to a certain function and vice versa, that that would also be the case for any increasing transformation of the function. But now, you have to be careful. It's got to be a transformation that, that this, in other words, this has to always be the case. So if I change this instead of, th here's where you could get a little bit tripped up. If I change this instead to say, okay, what about uh, u tilde of x1, x2 equals x1 squared plus x2? Is this an increasing transformation? I suppose it will depend on the values of x1 and x2 Precisely. and y1 and y2. So it's not, in general, an increasing transformation, right? I, I, I haven't, I ha if basically, if I multiply this, add anything to it, uh, apply an operation to it that, that changes the whole thing together, but always, but always without switching this, without switching the sign, I su suppose. Uh, well, anyways, there's such a thing as an increasing transformation, and this is not one of them, okay? So were you saying that if it preserves the relations of the entire set of goods to the entire other set of goods, then it's the s effectively the same utility function? Basically, yes. Um, but and, and functionally, it just has to be the case that for any for it to be an increasing transformation for any arguments, uh, for any arguments, uh, um, for any arguments. Uh, if the original function, this is basically saying the whole thing all over again. If the original function yielded, high, for any pairs of arguments, if the original function yielded a higher value for the first pair, then the second pair, so must the new function. Okay, so now, what is this? If we assume that people made their decisions, made choices, based on, based on maximizing their utility, right, we're moving into choice now, or even if we could just see what, all right, let's say they made their choices based on maximum utility, maximizing utility. Um, and so what does that tell us about what we can know about their utility functions? What can we identify about their utility functions? So like, I see someone making a bunch of choices, I'm trying to estimate their utility function based on those choices. You see someone making those choices, you're trying to estimate a utility function based on those choices. Uh, what do we know about those two different utility functions that you and I end up estimating? We do know one is preferred, but we can't say like. But well, utility yeah. function isn't preferred. Utility function is a function. Oh, right? sorry, yeah. I, but just just to be sort of more. One gives a higher uh, utility payoff than the other if it's uh, selected. We know that if the in, if, if the utility for the first function, if, if we're doing this right. Whenever the utility for the first function uh, of A exceeds, exceeds the utility of B for that first function, then for the second function, that must also be the case, right? But these do not need to be the same function. All we know is that, is that one must be a monotonic transformation of the other, or one must be an increasing function of the other, okay? So we, 
we, there's a lot of things we, we as I said, we couldn't differentiate between real, there's no way of, if we're just doing this based on choices, there'd be no way of differentiating someone who had this utility function or someone who had this utility function, et cetera. And, or there'd be no way of differentiating between someone who had, in fact, uh, utility of x1 comma x2 equals x1 to the alpha x2 to the beta and someone who had uh, I think it's you know alpha log x1 plus alpha log x2 sorry beta log x2 or someone who had uh, you know I can I could I could someone who had x1 to the just nothing times x2 to the beta I believe it's beta divided by alpha there's all sorts of representations of the same thing so computationally it means that when I'm trying to solve an abstract problem, like to, to solve an abstract, abstract problem having to do with, you know, how do I, what do I know someone's going to choose in a certain situation and how is that going to react to other things, that makes the computation easier. If I want to solve an optimization problem, um, if I want to solve an optimization problem, I can say, all right, well, whatever they choose with respect to the first utility function, they'll choose with respect to the simpler utility function. But if I'm actually trying to say something about the person's utility function, it means that there's really not a lot that I can observe about it. So does the absolute value of the utility function, is that irrelevant? It's just the relative value? Correct. The a well, certainly the absolute value of the utility function is equal to our complex. And in fact, so I think I, I messed up the camera here. And in fact, even uh, even less, you know, even sort of even less than that matters, if you know what I mean. Um, So, if you had to draw whichever way you drew a utility function, it would just be the same, like uh, in absolute terms. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, how do I draw? I can draw in difference curves. Yeah. Right. So, actually, yeah, one way of saying this is a whole bunch of utility functions will represent the same set of sets of indifference curves. And in fact, when we try talking about things like properties of utility functions. We end up talking, in the formal sense, we end up talking about things that are really sort of more related to indifference curves. Like you might have heard of quasi concavity or convex upper contour sets. So, yeah, so really, in a way, the indifference curves is all that can be identified about, uh, about the utility functions. Um, so, yeah, they're only identified up to monotonic transformations of one another. So, yeah, if I add a bunch, I can't, I, okay, so I also can't say like, uh, this person gets more utility than some other person. Because all I know is based, all I, at least in this framework, all I know is based on each person's choice, all I might be able to know is based on each person's choices, perhaps, for, you know, through revealed preference, but I don't know how much value they're getting from those choices. I don't even know, and we'll get to this uh, when we get to expected utility, which operates in a slightly different framework. I don't even know, like, if you chose, if you were asked to rank your university, and you ranked Oxford over Cambridge over uh, uh, um, Harvard. I really don't even know, like how much m more this whether this difference is greater than this difference in a meaningful sense. I don't know whether whether you'd be what whether you'd be willing to give up a certain probability of going to Harvard instead of Cam. Cambridge over a certain probability of getting to Oxford instead of Cambridge. I just kn really know the ordering of them. But when we get into expected utility, we have to make assumptions that will allow us, if we assume people are acting according to expected utility preferences, then you'll be able to identify the utility functions, not just up to a monotonic transformation, but up to a linear or affine transformation. Okay, let me take a break here, so I think I need to adjust the video.